Unplugged, Chapter 25, Jet Baranoff. Ivory's goons may be able to kidnap me, rough me up, and hold me in this chair, but they can't force me to look at their boss and her magic pen. I squirm in the seat, squeezing my eyes shut and trying to tune out that melodic voice telling me how relaxed I am. I'm not relaxed. I'm pretty much the polar opposite of relaxed. I'm freaked out. I'm scared to death, and mostly... I'm furious at this liar, this crook who brainwashes people and calls it meditation. This is a safe place, Ivory goes on silkily. A comfortable place. You want to be here. You are among friends. I keep my lids pressed tight. How about the hundreds of alligators out back? Are they friends too? Ivory doesn't miss a beat. If only you'd open your eyes. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I spit at her. Then you could brainwash me the way you brainwashed everybody else. A baron off writing you checks. How many alligators would that buy? Although my eyes are still shut, I detect a slight shift in Ivory's tone. It's still rich and smooth, but her meditation voice is gone. Now she's more conversational. You're a pretty smart kid, Jet. I should have expected that, considering who your father is. Not even Magnus ever came close to finding out about my little secret life. What part? I demanded, opening my eyes to glare at her. The big house, the fancy car, the alligator farm you paid for with other people's money, or maybe you just like being called Snapper. Very easy for you to say, Ivory replies bitterly, when your bank account was bursting before you were even born. You may disprove of my methods, but the end result is the same for both of us. We have. But I didn't brainwash anybody to get it. Ah, that, Ivory looks pensive. It brings up the problem of what I'm going to do with you. An intelligent boy like you must surely see that I can't release you until I have a chance to change your mind. She holds up the pen and flicks on the light. You understand? You have no choice. I close my eyes again. But for the first time, I actually see it from Ivory's point of view. If she lets me go, what I know can send her to prison for a lot of years. So, believe it or not, my only way out of this pickle is to let myself be brainwashed. My fevered mind races, struggling to come up with another way, but there just isn't one. Sometimes, Vlad always says, there's nothing you can do but pray for a miracle. Sorry, Dad. Miracles are for people like you, a guy whose little computer shop grew into a global tech empire. I'm not you, not smart enough, and definitely not as lucky. I grit my teeth and get ready to open my eyes and let Ivory do her worst. Here goes nothing. And then the outside world lights up like high noon and an earth-shaking kaboom jolts the house on its foundation, shattering glass all around us. Ivory and the goons wheel to face the source of the blast. Free at last, I leap to my feet in time to see a tremendous eruption of light and color through the empty space that used to be the picture window. It's like the entire 4th of July compressed into a few dazzling seconds with Roman candles spitting projectiles of flame in all directions, including into the house. Fireworks. My fireworks. But what set them off? A curious chipmunk? No time to worry about that now. I turn my heel and sprint for the front hall. One of the goons runs after me. Just as he reaches out and spins me around, a big sky rocket comes screaming in through the broken window and rams into the ceiling, raining plaster on both of us. With a loud bang, it goes off, filling the room with thick smoke. Suddenly, my pursuer is dancing frantically, slapping at the red, white, and blue sparks that cover him from head to toe. I leave him in my dust, pounding for the exit. A split second before I get there, the front door is flung wide, missing me about by a half inch. Grace and Tyrell have to put on their brakes to avoid flattening me. What are you doing here? I blurt. Rescuing you, stupid. Grace shoots back, the detonator still clutched in her hands. Let's go, rasped Tyrell, leading the charge out of the room and along the driveway. I follow, but over my shoulder, I can see Ivory and the goons coming out from the house, waving the smoking fr- smoke from their eyes. Beyond them, I catch a glimpse of the saline river. A stray rocket sails over the water, casting a pink glow over a boiling wave of escaping alligators. In spite of everything, I feel like cheering. I didn't blow the gate, but the gate blew, and that's the main thing. We're running our hardest, but the adults have longer legs than we do, and the gap is closing. Where are we going? I call. Surely they're not planning to hoof it all the way back to the oasis. Tyrell points. There! 
Straight ahead, half hidden in some tall grass, is one of the Oasis golf carts. At this point, I wouldn't trade it for Ivory's Ferrari and every Bentley in Silicon Valley. We jump aboard, me in the driver's seat. Hurry! Tyrell wheezes. They're almost here. Even as, I, even as I start up and steer out of the weeds, I know we're too late. They're all over us. I stomp on the accelerator and have the satisfaction of running over a goon's toe. I jam my foot hard on the pedal, but the wheels just spin. Ivory and the other goons are locked onto the shade, holding us in place. Two more goons come racing into the scene, hemming us in. We're caught. When I see the rage in Ivory's face, my fear level bumps up to an 11. The house is busted up. The alligators are gone. This is not going well. Chapter 26, Brooklyn Feldman. I shudder awake to urgent voices inside our college cottage, my dad and one other person. I sit up in bed and strain to eavesdrop. I looked in on him and he isn't there. The visitor is out of breath. I've been all over the oasis. He isn't anywhere. It's Matt, which means he's talking about Jet. I think back to the last words I heard him say. If you won't help me do the right thing, I'll do it myself. I throw on a sweatshirt and run out into the living room where my father is trying to calm Matt down. I think I know where Jet might have gone, I exclaim. Where, they chorus, to Hedge Apple. There's a giant mansion on the river just outside of town. Dad stares at me. How could he get all the way over there? But Matt doesn't need convincing. Don't even ask. I believe it 100%. This is Jet. If there's trouble around, he'll find it. My father is still skeptical. Why would Jet even know about this mansion? I don't mean to doubt you, Matt, but I hesitate to send the police on a wild goose chase when the boy could be out for a midnight stroll. I choose my words carefully. I don't want to get myself in trouble in case the history of Jet's visits to Hedge Apple comes up. Jet's obsessed with the place. He thinks there's a secret alligator farm there, and he thinks... I hesitate. I don't want to bring poor Ivory into this. A gangster named Snapper is in charge of it all. They gawk at me. I add weakly. I could be wrong. Jet's probably okay. At that moment, a flash from outside lights up the dim living room. A few seconds later, a muffled explosion rattles the cottage. Distant, but not too distant. We run to the window. To the north of the oasis, the sky glows, illuminating a rising plume of smoke. Oh my gosh, Jet blew up the mansion, I blurt. Or himself, Matt adds in horror. We need the police. My father pulls a key ring from a kitchen cabinet and heads to the, for the door. I'm going to the welcome center to get a phone. Matt is aghast. You don't have one here? I live by the same rules I set down for my guests, Dad replies righteously. I run into my room, grab the phone that I hide between the mattress and box springs, and give it to my father. He's stunned. But you surrendered your phone when you got here. I surrendered a phone, I confess. I've been coming here since I was six. I've learned to bring a spare. I'm probably going to hear about this later, but finding Jet is the top priority right now. Dad punches in 911, and between the three of us, we manage to stammer out the story of the missing kid and the explosion. The dispatcher tells us they've already gotten calls about the blast, and officers are on the way to check it out. Dad and I throw on clothes, and together with Matt, we run for the Range Rover. It's the first time I've seen my father behind the wheel of a car since I was six. In his life at the Oasis, there's always a buddy available to be the chauffeur. I don't remember him as a crazy driver, but we're burning rubber and shattering speed limits. I guess Dad is more worried about Jet than he lets on. By car, the trip to Hedge Apple is only a few minutes long compared with a 20-minute chug on the river. As we approach the road that leads to the mansion, three Arkansas State Police cars speed out in front of us, flashers whirling. Dad guns the accelerator, and we hit the dirt road flying. As we close in on the big house, the headlights of the lead squad car illuminate a frightening scene. In the weeds of the main driveway, Jet, Grace, and Tyrell are being dragged out of a golf cart by several large men. The cops blurt their sirens and the shocked attackers flee in the direction of the mansion. State troopers burst out of the cruisers, chasing down the fugitives and take them into custody. My father slams on the brakes and the three of us hit the ground running. Matt never struck me as the athletic type, but he covers the distance to Jet in Olympic sprinter time. Grace and Tyrell hunch nearby, their hands on their knees, panting. The three of them are shaken up, but don't seem hurt. My attention shifts to the arrest taking place just beyond us. My eyes jump from face to face. Four large, muscular men and... Ivory? Dad breathes in astonishment. 
I'm every bit as stunned as he is. I knew Jet suspected Ivory, I managed. I never told you because in a million years I didn't believe it could be true. We watched as a trooper slapped handcuffs on the Oasis's number two. The six foot four Ivory receives no gentler treatment than her employees. As she struggles against the tight shackles, her expression bears no resemblance to the usual serene smile of the center's meditation pathfinder. The cop is no shrimp himself, but he has to wrestle Ivory all the way to the squad car. Face, you need to call Game and Fish, he says into the walkie-talkie. We've got upward of 300 alligators released into the Saline River. You heard me, alligators. Like, see you later, alligator. For me, that's the crowning glory. Jet was right about that, too. That was the truth, I asked Jet, who has finally managed to wiggle his way out of Matt's bear hug. Grace nods solemnly. We owe Jet a huge apology. We didn't believe him when he ha- he was the only one who knew anything. I'm the one who owes you guys everything, Jet says fervently. You probably saved my life tonight. The trooper has Ivory almost in the car when my father steps forward and faces his meditation pathfinder. For an electric moment, the two square off. I'm holding my breath. What will Marvin Feldman, a.k.a. Magnus Fellini, say to his second-in-command who betrayed him so totally? My dad places a hand on the shoulder of Ivory's gown and says sincerely, Be whole, Ivory. Fool! Ivory's eyes bulge. You think I liked your terrible food and your dime store philosophy. My one consolation going to prison is I no longer have to pretend that you have something to offer any living creature with an IQ greater than a pineapple. Jet springs forward his face flaming red. Hey, lay off Nimbus. Can't you see he's trying to be cool about this even though you stabbed him in the back? Okay, so maybe his food stinks and his philosophy isn't for everybody. He believes in what he does and there's nothing phony about that. Unlike you, he's a better person than you'll ever be. Ivory seems genuinely bewildered. Who's Nimbus? The trooper locks her in the back of the squad car so she never gets an answer. My father turns to Jet. Thank you. That was very affirming. Now let's get back to the Oasis. It's late and we've all had a busy night. As we pile into the Range Rover, a smile tugs at Dad's lips. Nimbus, he murmurs.